the legacy of a certain failed Austrian painter who rose to prominence in Germany in the 1930s, hangs over us today like a thick fog. It blinds us to the forces which have almost completed the transition away from democracy to something far more dangerous. This is because so many of us lowered our guard, expecting the next version of despotism to arrive in fancy dress, complete with armbands and jackboots. But history never repeats in that way, particularly because rulers and ruled alike got burned, metaphorically and literally, last time around. And those at the top were not about to repeat the mistake. In any case, the German example was an outlier, a peculiar confluence of the rampant antisemitism and cultural blind obedience which had prevailed for generations, together with the unique economic decline of post-First World War Germany. Other fascisms of the period, while unpalatable to any true democrat, tended to be less extreme, and more nationally rather than racially orientated. Where Hitler claimed to be the embodiment of the mythical Aryan race, less maniacal dictators claimed only to be the arbiters of the ongoing tensions between the various groups which made up their respective nations. Nor was this corporatist ideology anything new. As John Rawls Tun Saul argues, this early form of corporatism gradually emerged as the only serious alternative to democracy. It was increasingly proposed by the Catholic elites of Europe. They could accept the Industrial Revolution, so long as individualism was replaced by group membership. Many of these groups were apparently benign or even beneficial. Workers' unions, industrial owners' associations, professional associations. These corporations were not to function in conflict with each other. Through ongoing negotiations, they were to be non-threatening and non-confrontational bodies. Some of this system was formalized by Bismarck in the new Germany of the 1870s. But the corporatist alternative's moment of glory, so to speak, came half a century later under Mussolini and various other dictators, such as Portugal Salazar. Despite the protestations of establishment media outlets and what passes for a political left these days, who tell us that every rising politician from outside the cozy neoliberal consensus is the new Hitler, there is not going to be a repeat of the rise of the dictators in the 1920s and 1930s. The ruling classes have learned that lesson all too well. Nevertheless, the drive to replace democracy with a corporatist alternative is as strong today as it was back then. As Saul points out, the last thing today's neo-corporatists want is to be confused with these unpleasant dictators. Most of the intellectuals now involved in pushing this social formula are well-established university professors, political scientists, sociologists, and economists, spread throughout the West. And yet, what they propose, bald violence of the earlier generation aside, is virtually identical to the earlier model. They propose a basic shifting of legitimacy in our society from the citizen to the group. They don't put it quite that way. They talk modestly about facilitating the relationship between competing interest groups. The effect, however, would be far more profound than that. In fact, I believe that we are already very close to having shifted the legitimacy inside Western society. Real power today rests with neo-corporatism, which is in fact, old-fashioned corporatism. That was quarter of a century ago. Bill Clinton had begun the process of cementing a new neoliberal consensus into place. But his partner in crime, Tony Blair, had only just been elected. At the time, various terms, neo-corporatist, neo-conservative and even neo-fascist, each subtly different, but each marking the same shift of legitimacy from the individual to the group, were being banded around. In the hands of Clinton's Democrats and Blair's Labour, corporatism donned the facade of liberal democracy but with none of its substance in what became known as neoliberalism. A better term would be fake liberalism. Fake, that is, in the sense of counterfeit, like the counterfeit Gucci handbags and Chanel perfume proffered by the illegal street vendors on London's Oxford Street. Although eroded to a considerable extent, the trappings of liberal democracy, political parties, free elections, freedom of thought and action, the right to peaceful protest, etc., appear to be in place. But they have either been limited, qualified, curtailed or bypassed. In the age of social media, the public square is controlled by corporate power. Corporate censorship has caused most of us to develop the binary mode of thinking described by the subjects of the Soviet Union, in which one keeps one's private opinions to oneself, while publicly parroting the approved party line. Obviously there is no such thing as a woman. Clearly a vaccine need neither prevent disease, stop transmission, nor even be safer than the disease itself. And windmills and electric vehicles will definitely cool the global temperature.
Power, meanwhile, rests with a new corporate elite whose spurious claim to specialist knowledge and expertise provides justification for their elevated status. Managers, who used to be the hired help, paid only to maximize shareholder profit, now hide behind an amorphous stakeholder capitalism, which obliges them to be answerable to all, and thus accountable to nobody. Elected politicians meanwhile genuflect at the altar of new globalist bodies to which they have sold their souls along with the power once held by national electorates. And those global bodies, special corporate courts, international banks, customs unions and privileged think tanks, in turn, are well on the way to dismantling what remains of national democratic structures. Borders, what borders? The trick, which is where the fakery comes in, has been to appear to overprivilege the individual. In Thatcher's formulation, there is no such thing as society. Not just in a free market, which has clearly been captured by corporate power to an extent which would have horrified classical liberals like Adam Smith. But neoliberalism also atomizes society into powerless individuals whose only means of exercising agency is as a member of one or other group. This is a travesty of democratic liberalism, in which markets are free from monopoly and corporate capture, and in which active and disinterested individuals operate as a part of a free citizenry. That is, true liberal democracy operates in the public interest, not in the interest of special groups, each with varying degrees of power. As a measure of this, Saul points to the one part of the economy which has continued to grow. A simple test of our situation would involve examining the health of the public good. For example, there has never been so much money, actual money, disposable cash, in circulation as there is today. I am measuring this both in absolute terms and on a per capita basis. Look at the growth of the banking industry and the even more explosive growth of money markets. There has never been so much disposable money, yet there is no money for the public good. In a democracy this would not be the case, because the society would be centered, by general agreement, on disinterest. In a corporatist system there is never any money for the public good because the society is reduced to the sum of the interests. It is therefore limited to measurable self-interest. This is, of course, a crisis in itself. Because while neoliberals make the claim that democracy is the consequence of free markets, technology and industrialization, the reverse is in fact, the case. And this has serious ramifications for us today, as we face a growing list of potentially existential economic, energetic and environmental crises. One of the most obvious features of corporatism, both the 1930s version and today's, is its lack of creativity. Free, and particularly disruptive and innovative, thought is anathema to the corporate interest, and is therefore stifled and censored. So that, just at the point where we need creative solutions, we are served a lukewarm dish of groupthink so old it has evolved new species of mold on its surface. Consider the non-solutions to climate change. Just as I am writing these words, for example, the representatives of Western neoliberal corporatism have flown into the Swiss resort of Davos on more than a thousand private jets and have booked up all of the tables at the resort's five-star steak restaurants, along, allegedly, with the services of some of Europe's most expensive prostitutes, for the entire week of the World Economic Forum's annual conference. A conference where they will tell we mere peasants that we can no longer eat meat or fly to our annual holidays. The giveaway was the dissonance between their words and their deeds. It was as if the rich folks who live in the swanky penthouse apartments had come running down to the lower floor screaming that the building was on fire and that everyone had to evacuate. But then, when all of the ordinary folks were left outside in the cold rainy night, dressed only in their pajamas, the rich folks went back up to their penthouses and carried on as if nothing had happened. That was the so-called climate emergency, the claim that we, by which they meant only the little people, had to act now, which always seemed to amount to more corporate welfare for them, and more eco-austerity for everyone else, to prevent disaster by reaching net zero by the end of the decade. Climate change is real enough, although occurring on a far more gradual timescale than the WEF technocrats would have us believe, but the proposed solutions are entirely fake. To the untrained eye, the WEF technocracy's fourth industrial revolution, Great Reset, Green New Deal, which ignores almost all of the crises engulfing us, looks plausible enough. After all, we have been drip-fed a diet of fake information about so-called renewable electricity-generating technologies, by a similarly invested establishment media. 
It is only when we take the time to listen to energy experts, particularly physicists who understand the physical limits and engineers who have to find ways of putting policy into practice, that we discover that the proposed net zero goals are unworkable without rapidly deindustrializing and depopulating the Western states, and very likely much of the rest of the world too. This latter possibility has inevitably given rise to grand conspiracy theories. Some, they, hiding in the shadows, for whom the WEF technocracy are merely the paid administrators, has, for reasons unspecified, decided that they must engineer the rapid premature deaths of billions of people. Although it is hard to understand how this would benefit anyone. Not least because the wealth and power of those at the top ultimately rests on the mass consumption and mass indebtedness of the billions at the bottom who they are, according to the online conspiratorium, determined to kill off. This is not to suggest that conspiracies don't occur, or that the conspiring among the rich and powerful isn't more likely to succeed than conspiracies lower down the pecking order. It is simply that social hierarchies tend to operate to thwart rather than assist conspiracy. The old Masonic image of the all-seeing eye at the top of the pyramid, famously reproduced on American paper currency, was more akin to the little old man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz, a tool to frighten the masses, than a true representation of power. In reality, the hierarchy, like the human brain, acts to suppress and censor information at every level. Only a tiny fraction of the information that is available at the bottom ever makes it to the top. And the fraction that does, is that which was deemed acceptable to be passed upward at each level. As a senior civil servant once told me, only send the minister those problems for which we have solutions. The problem seems far more to do with the unintended consequences of the neoliberal solutions to the crises of the 1970s. The immediate aim, crushing wages in order to curb rampant inflation, appeared successful. Although the collapse in wages was far more to do with the oil shock-induced recessions brought about by the OPEC oil embargo and later the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War, than with the mythological expertise of St. Paul Volcker. I throw Volcker in here, because he is the archetypal neoliberal technocrat. Laying claim to some esoteric econometric knowledge and expertise, Volcker and his followers promoted the fake narrative that through manipulation of interest rates it was they, not the global recession, which defeated inflation in the early 1980s. Crucially, it was on the back of such claims that the technocrats began pursuing their claim that they alone knew how best to run the world, and that they should be allowed to operate from a position above and beyond the organs of democratic oversight which, they claimed, had been colonized by ignorant and often prejudiced plebeians whose constant dispute stood in the way of progress. What began with the central bankers and university economics departments, gradually spread to every area of human activity. And gradually a technocracy has usurped the democratic order which had propelled the Western states to greatness in the first place. True technocracy, ruled by experts, could base its legitimacy on the claim that its aggregate knowledge and understanding of the workings of our increasingly complex society allows it to stand head and shoulders above the rest of us. But I will argue that today we have a fake technocracy. One whose response to a series of very real threats to civilization has been to ignore problems entirely or to retreat into the realms of impossible fantasy utopias, dragging the rest of us along with them, in a way that makes the various threats ever more likely to bring about collapse. It is for this reason that I refer to the technocracy, along with the various special interest groups it promotes, as a death cult, either passively acquiescing in, or actively creating the existential crises which are now washing over us. Around the world, there is growing awareness of the abject failure of our fake technocracy. In the developed Western states there have been growing political movements around some version of the desire to take back control. Although thus far, that political energy has been captured by charlatans, chancers and ne'er-do-wells who promise to make countries great again, but leave them in a worse state than they had been. Beyond the Western states, much of the world's nations are also seeking some alternative. Although one suspects that swapping the Western Empire for a new, China-Russia-led BRICS bloc might be a case of out of the frying pan into the fire. The question is, how we came to arrive at this impasse? And, more importantly given the urgency of the crises before us, can we change things for the better? Or was Margaret Thatcher right all those years ago when she claimed that, there is no alternative, 